Welcome. Welcome to Cranfield University. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. We know how busy a day you've got. So thank you. My name is Toby. I'm studio director here at the glorious Granville Turner Studios here on Cranfield campus. And you'll see behind me a live image of the Cranfield campus. Bit of a gray day. Uh, tell us where you are in the world. It's always nice to know whereabouts you are in the world. So put something into the text chat. Find the Zoom text chat. Must be your second or third Zoom meeting of the day. Put something in the text chat just saying where you are, uh, and we'll shout out. We're going to be together today talking about uh, marketing and leadership, just in case you're in the wrong meeting, <laughs> for about, I reckon, an hour. No more than an hour. I promise to you is that we won't go beyond the hour mark. And if we're running out of things to say, unlikely, uh, then we'll finish early. Otherwise, we're going to be finishing at the GMT around about uh, 3.30. So again, thank you for coming. No one's put anything in the text chat yet, so please, I'm relying on you. And if you're watching the recording, uh, thank you for joining and watching the recording. Please keep the conversation going with Cranfield, specifically about marketing and uh, strategic leadership that we're going to be talking about. We have an amazing bunch of people joining us today, not least of which, this is the build-up Anne-Marie, <laughs> get ready, not least of which is Anne-Marie, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Hanlon, course director. Thank you for joining us. Say more about yourself. Why are you in here? Thank you so much, Toby. It's great to be here and to join you today in the studio as well. Interestingly, I did the wrong first degree. The wrong? The wrong first degree. I did the first degree in uh, French and linguistics. Oh, wow. And I took my CIM, my Chartered Institute yes. of Marketing Diploma at night school wow. for two evenings a week when I realized I was in a marketing job. This is a few years ago. It's a few years you ago. You haven't got to say how many years it's ago. It's a few years ago. I won't say how many <laughs> years ago, but it was a few years ago. I had so much fun doing that that I took a master's afterwards. And I think, had this master's been around, I could have done the whole thing in one go. We knew you were going to say that. So that's where your mar marketing interest started? Yes, absolutely it did. See, I am? Like, well, yes. And I think like many marketers, I'm an accidental marketer. <laughs> many people start their careers in some direction and then discover they're in marketing. And that's the point where you think, actually, Maybe I need a formal marketing qualification. So they didn't want to go into marketing, but they just found themselves in marketing. Maybe they didn't even know about marketing. Uh, maybe they weren't aware of it. And maybe they were doing something and discovered, actually, it wasn't so interesting. They moved into something else and then thought, like I had, some of my friends said to me, oh, wow, you're in marketing. And I remember saying to them, I am. I am. No I one am. told me. I better get a qualification <laughs> in it. So I took the CIM uh, Chartered Institute of Marketing diploma at that time. Wow. If any of this is resonating with you, and we hope it is, that you're in the right place. We're going to be talking and doing a deep dive into one of the courses here at Cranfield University. Uh, UK, Ed, thank you. Ed is the only person so far is saying where you are. UK is a bit broad, Ed. Uh, but don't worry, we're not going to we're not going to follow up on that. We're also joined, and it's worth me sh pointing out some other guests that we have joining us today, and it's your chance to ask a bunch of questions uh, coming up on screen. Look at that. From left to right is the fantastic smiling Christina Goodman. Christina, it's great to have you with us. It's always nice working with you. Christina can answer a whole ton of apprenticeship-oriented type questions. We're joined by, not least, um, James. James, I recognize you from many a, a broadcast. So James, it's fantastic to have you with us. Um, and then, last but not least, Sarah. Sorry, you must be in your kitchen, unless that's a, a funny background there. That's your kitchen, right? In the kitchen today. <laughs> wow. So Sarah's a, a student on the current course. So if you're curious about what it's like being a student and the benefits of the course, Sarah's the person to ask. And to do that, Charlotte, I've just seen London. Thank you. That kind of narrows it down. You can ask questions pretty much at any time through the time that we're together, about an hour. Any questions? Hard questions are good. Practical questions, pragmatic questions are good. Uh, where does this go? What do you do? Why are we doing it? stuff like that. So please, in the text chat, put us, put us a question. Can you pitch, a little, before you go into some slides, you've got some slides for us in a minute, just pitch this program. Um, who do you think the audience is here and why should they be interested in your course? That's a really good question, Toby. I think the audience is those who are in marketing that maybe either did a different first degree and they want to get a specific qualification in marketing and leadership. Mm -hmm. They want to go further in their organizations. It's also for those who didn't get the opportunity to go to university first time round. Mm -hmm. They've been in a marketing role for a little while 
and they think, do you know what, now is the time to formalise everything I've learned over the last so many years. That's who it's really for. And is there a particular reason why now? Why marketing now? Things are getting bigger, broader? Well, how would you say contextually? I think the issue today is there are many people who say they're in marketing, but what they're in is they're in tactical communications. Mm -hmm. They're doing communications at a tactical level. They don't understand marketing strategy. They don't understand how to actually take an organization through, through growth, how to innovate, how to build strong brands, or even how to financially account for all of those things. And that's what this degree does. So you're going to talk several times today, I'm sure, about the breadth and the strategic nature of what it is we're talking about. Is that, am I fair to say, that's the, the differentiated right. with Crownfield? Yeah, it is that strategic focus. So it's marketing at a strategic level and leadership. Brilliant. OK, you've got some slides. Let's talk us through those slides. The slides then are looking at the deep dive on the course. Is that right, roughly pitching these yeah, slides? Yeah, they are. Brilliant. They are. You've and I think the first one's actually come up on the screen now. It is, yes. Over to you. Yeah. I'm going to pass over to you. you OK, you thank you. So we'll move on to the next slide. And the other key thing, Toby, I should say about this course is this isn't a course where we thought, oh, it would be a really good idea to create a degree in marketing. Uh, we actually went out to, um, to the marketing world, to executives, to chief executives, and we said, what is it you're looking for from your marketing leaders? And they said, well, do you know what? We want, we want them to know more about leadership and accounting. But the other major thing about this degree, which is completely different, is this was developed in partnership with the CIM Academy. Mm -hmm. And James Sutton, who we're really lucky that he's, he's dedicated the time to come along and join us today, he's the director of strategy, uh, he's the commercial and strategic director at the Charter Institute of Marketing. In fact, on Thursday, he was at the CIM AGM presenting their brand new strategy. So they do know what they're talking about when it comes to strategy. And this means that students get more than just one qualification. So they graduate, they get their MSc in Marketing and Leadership, and then when they've completed that, if they sign up to be a registered marketer, they can become a charter marketer and also get their CIM diploma. So the course is in two parts. I've jumped around a little on the slide, but the course is in two parts. Part one is the apprenticeship and that takes you through all the taught modules, and I'll mention those in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then part two is the MSc element, which effectively is the work-based project. It's sort of the thesis, but it's an action-based thesis. So that's the key. So again, as I say, this is the other difference with this program, is that relationship with the Charter Institute of Marketing, which is extremely valuable because obviously the CIM is the leading marketing institute worldwide. And if we look on to the next slide, this shows you the composition of the programme. So it takes place over two years. So year one, you're on campus here in Cranfield. And if you are wondering where Cranfield is, because many people do wonder, it's halfway between Bedford and Milton Keynes. We're right in our own beautiful campus here. And so in year one, you have four modules, um, or four weeks, and in each week, you're undertaking two modules. So they're intensive weeks while you're here on campus. And then in year two, you've got, first of all, in January, you've got two modules. In March, you've got one module, and that actually takes place at the Charter Institute of Marketing at their business centre in Cookham in Berkshire. In May, you then look at how do you evaluate marketing effectiveness, and then if you've decided that you want to gain the MSc part, not just the apprenticeship, you then undertake later on a research methods uh, programme and the thesis. You undertake the thesis, the action learning part of the course. And if we go on to the next slide, I think I've probably covered this, but these are the elements that really make us different. But it is based on practical insights from many organisations, and we have unusual model modules such as 
growth and innovation, which is very different to anywhere else. And we take students on a journey, so there is a flow where we build up from one module to the next. So we're constantly building up that knowledge and the skills so that behaviour can translate into the workplace. And then if we go on to the next slide, that's basically my last slide. And that's, if you want to know more, that's a QR code and link to where to discover more on the web page. So Toby, that gives you an indication of the key things on there. Fantastic. Not too many slides. No, it's good. We don't want death by PowerPoint. No, we don't. And there's, I think what I sense from what you just said there, there's a maturity to what you're talking about. The focus is, it's not the basics of marketing. Everyone knows the marketing basics. This is accounting, innovation and growth, as you said. Um, what are you expecting in terms of people's prior knowledge? Should they be accountants already? No, it really varies. Some people come to us and they, for example, have worked in marketing communications for many years. Some people have maybe got four, five, six years experience. Mm -hmm. Some people have um, just started their leadership journey. Some people have got no marketing knowledge at all. Whoa. But we don't necessarily miss the basics, but we take them through that at a pace mm -hmm. so that they know the pieces that they need to know if they're managing a marketing team. Right. You don't need to know. If you're, um, I don't know, if you're conducting an orchestra, you don't need to know how to play every instrument. Good point. Maybe like you play, the metaphor. Well, maybe you play the piano. Maybe you're a harpist or a, a violinist. Someone tells me you're one of those. Um, I'm really not, but I love <laughs> listening to music. But the key thing is to, to conduct the orchestra, you don't need to uh, learn how to play every instrument. Mm. You need to have an appreciation. I like that. And that's what we do. I like that. So interest in the area, you see your career headed in that direction, get the fundamentals um, under your belt, but get this. So growth, when you said growth, is that organizational growth? Is personal growth? What is that growth? Interesting, it's a mix of both. So there's, there's two things. The particular module that I'm thinking about, which is called growth and innovation, that's about business growth. Mm -hmm. Today, right now, if you don't grow a business, it's declining by 5% a year. Wow. Because 5% of your customers disappear. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've, they've merged, they go out of business, they close, they move into a different sector. So if you don't grow your business, by at least 10% a year, you're stagnating. You can't stand still. You can't. You've got to do something. Mm. But we also look at value propositions. What does value mean? Mm -hmm. What does value mean to your, to your audience, to your stakeholders, whether they're customers, clients, shareholders, whoever they are? You may work for a charity, and we do have people coming on to the program who work in charities. Mm -hmm. Um, you may work at an agency. We have many agency people on the program as well. And you're working with clients and you're trying to pivot your knowledge to apply in many different places. But the personal growth is we see, and I think for me, one of the really rewarding things is seeing my students grow. That is rewarding. You're just seeing, and, and actually, Many of them, before they've, because we always say, you know, this helps you to go on to that next role within mm -hmm. your company. Mm -hmm. But many of them, before they've even graduated, have been promoted or have gone um, wow. into greater things. That's satisfying for you to see. Oh, it's wonderful. It's really rewarding. Opens up. You talked about several when they're here at uh, Camp Frampo Campus. What are those days like? Is it like uh, eight in the morning till eight at night lectures? What does an average day look like? It's pretty intensive oh. because we do we do shoehorn it into a week mm -hmm. because we know they're really busy. Mm -hmm. And one of the requirements for any apprenticeship is that you're actually working and your company effectively sponsors you. Right. And from that perspective, we start our classes at 8.30 wow. and we finish the class at 5.45. That's a long day. So it is a long day. It is at 8 till 6 in the class. Mm. Um, we have two classes in the morning, mm -hmm. 
you do get a coffee break. <laughs> Good. You're then we give generous. you a lunch break, <laughs> and then you get two classes in the afternoon with a coffee break. Right. So there is that in there. And that's yeah. you and your colleagues in marketing. Uh, it's a range of academics oh, it, that you it's, will see. It's um, over the different modules. So there are what two, four, six, eight, uh, nine. Ten. 12 modules, I should know automatically no, what no, this no, is. No, no, no. Whatever the number of modules is, there mm. are that many tutors. Wow. Um, so there's a range of tutors with some brilliant expertise. And I think one of, the, one of the great things, one of the many great things for me about Cranfield, because I'm a newer academic. Yeah, but I you're biased, you like Cranfield. I do, but I, I, do ha too. I haven't been in academia for decades. So you're I'm an accidental academic as well as an accidental marketeer. I am. What's going on? So I, I did a guest lecture and another guest lecture and I thought this is fun. <laughs> I'd been in consultancy for 25 years ah. and then I, I segued into academia. And you're a French speaker and a linguist as well. But one of the key things about Cranfield is our teachers, our tutors, our lecturers, professors here have real world experience. Yes. Pragmatic. We, we're not 21 year olds who've just graduated and we're teaching you. We've got pretty heavy duty experience. Wow, okay. And I, that makes a big difference. That's good to know. So please, if you've got any questions from what you just heard, uh, what you're about to hear, please type something into the text chat. Ed, I'm just trying to keep up, Ed, with where you are in the world. There is a question and DH, the snappily named DH, I'll come around to that question uh, in a bit. You bigged up um, James, so Absolutely. I want to cut to James. So James, if you're ready, we want to see from you. I know you've got some slide for us. But James, just situate CIM, world leading, uh, Anne-Marie, you said. Yeah. James, we're bigging you up there. Tell us more about who you are, your role, and CIM. Okay, who I, so I have two kind of hats that I wear on a regular basis. So one side I look after CIM's training offering, so the non-accredited um, education side, which is about 130 different training courses covering the whole spectrum of marketing. Um, and that's where anyone, member of the public, can go on those courses, um, or we do customised programmes for organisations. The, the other part is I look after CIM Academy, which is where this relationship really comes together with Cranfield. Um, and CIM Academy is CIM's uh, wholly owned uh, study centre that delivers CIM's qualifications. For me, I've been part of CIM for over 20 years. Wow. I think my passion, yes, I love marketing, of course, but <laughs> I'm really passionate about what professional bodies are there to do. Um, and that could be in any kind of discipline. So I, I really believe, and I, I really like the conversation around growth. Mm -hmm. you know, we're a not-for-profit, but actually we like to think of ourselves as not purely for profit. You know, all, all organisations need to be prosperous to enable them to do the things mm -hmm. they need to do, whatever they might um, they might be. So I think that's uh, having that growth mindset applies just as much to a commercial organisation, or an overtly commercial organisation, as it does to a, a, a charity as well. I think the principles are the same. So that's kind of a bit about... Uh, me, I've known Anne-Marie for a, a long time about that relationship and um, when we started these conversations a few years ago, just really um, excited to kind of build a program which is very different, I think, to, uh, to any other. James, it's great to be working with you. That logo over your shoulder there, I recognise that logo. I take it it isn't a logo. It's our crest, they're yes. paintings that a few paintings. years ago a member ah. of staff painted about seven different ones so they're oh, around wow. the building, they're all individual and uh, I'm holding on to that one before uh, <laughs> it, it, it goes walks. Worth a fortune and you're in Cookham today and, I, and yes. something tells me you're not an accidental marketeer, I can tell from what you said. Uh, I'm, I'm probably an accident to lots of things, but that's probably for another time. <laughs> James, I know you've got some slides for us, so I'm going to hand over to you with your slides. And you're okay. talking about CIM generally, how, how you work, is that right? Uh, just very briefly about what we're here for overall, um, but also then touching back on uh, the elements of the CIM qualification which fits into this programme, which follows on from what Anne-Marie was saying. Um, Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm going to hand so, over yeah. to you with your slides. Thank you. Okay, can we just move on, please? Thank you. So I touched on this a little bit earlier. For those of you that are familiar with CIM, maybe you've been a member or done a core application in the past, 
Um, you might be used to some of the products we have or services uh, that we do, but underneath all of that that sits right at the heart of kind of why we exist as an organization is our Royal Charter uh, specifies very clearly what we're here for. What is Before we get to products and how actually we interact with the customers and the profession as a whole. So we do have a responsibility and a role to uh, listen and to represent um, the profession. And I think a key thing to say there is it's not blind representation. So we need to focus on what good practice is and highlight bad practice. You know, no profession is absolutely perfect and not every practitioner in any um, profession doesn't have room for improvement. So part of our role is really then to look at well, what are the standards for the marketing profession? What does good look like? So we have a uh, set a professional marketing framework, which is a set of standards that we use not just to benchmark qualification products, but when we go into companies, we can assess teams, etc. So it's kind of like the, the the foundation of what actually is this profession we're talking about. It's very broad, and how do you progress through it, and what skills you need. The next thing, which is very relevant to what we're here to talk about today, is um, how we develop people. How do we develop the capability? So we can improve the capability of um, the world's population of marketers through partnerships or direct. Um, then that can help improve the performance and capability of the organisations they work with. That can ultimately lead to a more prosperous economy and society. So. Any professional body is ultimately here for economic and societal good. So what can we do to make sure that we are supporting to create the best people we possibly can to make the biggest impact? And the next area really is about accreditation, and we'll come on to this a bit more uh, in a moment. So as a professional body, we have the ability not just to accredit um, people for passing a qualification, and give them designatory letters and a certificate. We also accredit professional practice, so we can accredit a combination of experience, qualifications, and currency about whether somebody is up to date or not. And the last point, really, which is absolutely critical to everything I've mentioned so far, is um, the community. How do we help facilitate bringing the community of marketers and other um, stakeholders together because I think ultimately any profession or discipline grows more from the interaction with each other than just simply saying and here's another here's another program so this fits into this program so nicely because the value and I think we're going to hear from Sarah a bit later but the, the value of actually learning from others around for me is just as critical to any of the material um, or the lectures you have learning from other people. And sometimes we all get a bit tra trapped in our own businesses sometimes to get out and learn from others. So how we bring the global community together is really important. You can just flip onto the next slide, please. So. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but CIM in numbers. So we have 25,000 members across many countries in the world. Every year through our own qualifications, we have over 15,000 people doing our assessments. Um, and there are over three, uh, 750 degree programs around the world that are accredited against those standards I mentioned about the, the framework. But the point of this slide really is the giant number one in the in the middle, and that's not down to being first or, or anything else like that. That's to say that there, although we have all these relationships and products and customers around the world, there is only one program like this. There is only one program where we have worked together as two organizations, Cranfield and CIM, to integrate our two offerings to try and give um, something quite unique to the marketplace. And that's what that number one is, that all this other going on, this, I believe, this um, this relationship and this program is, is quite special. Can just go on to the next slide, please? So very, very practically, um, Amory mentioned about that uh, CIM's program is 
uh, built into the apprenticeship and then the and, and the full MSc. What that means is the so CIM has uh, its top level qualification. It's level seven, seven qualification is called the CIM Marketing Leadership Program. What we have done is discounted. We've exempted because it's already covered in the um, Cranfield course. Our first module, which is contemporary challenges, leading change, which is a fantastic module. We run it here in Cookham, so all the delegates come over um, and spend kind of three days with us. And have to put up with uh, dinner with a few of us as well. Um, and once they've completed that, then they also get a specific uh, module certificate for that standalone module. The consultancy module is embedded into the thesis of the um, top up MSc. Um, and I think that's probably the last slide. So I've only got a couple of bits to add on. You might want to take those down. Um, okay. So, I can I just add so, so what what Amory touched on of what you actually get of combining these two things, and I, I try and make sure I don't forget one. So, if you go through the whole program, there's the apprenticeship, there's the leading change module at the time. You will also be a member of CIM for the duration of your studies, which means based depending on your experience, you can also get designatory letters after your name for practice. And then once you do go on to the full um, the part two to get that full MSc, you will also get the CIM marketing leadership qualification. And if you've been collecting your CPD, you could also be a chartered marketer by the end. And in a two year period, I don't believe there is any other route where you can get all of those accreditations in that time. That's pretty special. That's pretty special. Why would you not? I guess, James, you're going to, I know what you're going to say about this. But why would you not want all of those things? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think a single reason. <laughs> I guess everyone knows CIM. I mean, there's a reason there why we're, we're allied and partnered with them. What an amazing opportunity. Why? You, most people take that up, I'm assuming, on the course, those four oh, options. Absolutely, absolutely. And in addition to all the qualifications that James listed, you get your MSc in marketing and leadership as well. How cool is that? So you could literally go from somebody who's worked in, um, in industry for some years, didn't get the opportunity to go to university first time around, and literally within a couple of years, you fulfilled academic and vocal, vocational qualifications at the same time. It is pretty special. Pretty special. James, stick around. Christina, we're going to come to you very shortly, but there's some bad news. There are some deadlines. There are deadlines. And they're coming up. So we've got, an, what is it, the expression of interest is 12th of Feb, which by my reckoning is next week. Yeah, yeah. We, we, um, we've been speaking to many companies about this, but there has to be a cutoff point. Yeah. So the expression of interest is a, is a fairly long, complex form that's data is required by government mm -hmm. because the majority of the fee is funded through the government apprenticeship levy. Right. And obviously they've got to check that you're a bona fide company, mm -hmm. you're doing things properly, and you're doing what you should be doing. Mm. So there's bits of paperwork to do there and we can help take you through that. There is that, and then there's the actual deadline for the individual application, 26 which is of Feb, 26th of Feb. Which is coming yeah. up soon. Yeah. And the course starts 15th of April. 15th of April. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an induction day when the course starts, and then you're Monday pretty much... Monday the 15th of April, induction day. Get yourself here. And then Tuesday the 16th. You're straight in. You're straight in. And actually, you're straight into the first module, which is understanding markets and competitors. Wow. To explain the whole of the background. And do you know who the, uh, the uh, lecturer is for that module? You. It would be me. Hey! Yeah. So I see the students right at the very beginning. Then my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Dennis Esch, mm -hmm. takes students then for in between on the Wednesday and Thursday, takes them through understanding consumers. And then I catch up with them at the end of the week on the Friday to finish the module and see how that first week was. Fantastic. So you recognize his face, remember this face. There is a question already, and Jessica is bursting to know, you mentioned uh, you're here on site during the sessions. Is there a mixture of blended sessions? And how often are we here again? Remind us again. How often? Sure. We, we don't do blended. Oh, you we don't? do do face okay. to face. So it's all face to face. It is all face to face. You get so much. One of the things James said, which was fascinating, 
it's not just learning from the lecturers and the professors in the room. It's each other. It's each other. And we have an extraordinary cohort. Every cohort is extraordinary. They're from different organisations and they get the chance to, between themselves, talk about those organisations and learn from each other. You don't get that to that degree if you do it online. Right. How many times do you need to be here? You're here in April, June, September, November this do you, year. Do you get that, Jessica? So it's basically four times a year. Four times a year. Yeah. Four times it's a not year. a full week each time. Mm -hmm. It is the first time. But the slide deck, the pack shows you, and the link at the end shows you the dates when you are actually on campus. Brilliant. Jessica, we're keen to hear from you. Sam is asking, if we can't start in April, when is the next intake? April. <laughs> but April 2025. That seems it's like a long, once a year. long time You miss ago. this bus, you sit on the next bus, which is in a year's time. Sam, we hope to see you. We really do hope to see you. But April uh, at the following year. Uh, thank you for those questions. How, and before we go to uh, Christina, a quick, quick one from Charlotte. How long would you give yourself to, s to sort the paperwork before the deadline? Charlotte's worried about that deadline. Yeah, I think what you need, Charlotte, there is we've created um, an expression of interest checklist. Mm -hmm. And Christina, who's coming on, can also help and talk you through that as well. But you probably need information that's held uh, by your finance team within the organisation. It's things like, are you a registered company? If so, what's the registration number? Do you have a health and safety policy? Do you have public liability insurance? We've got a checklist that we can share and send to you so you know exactly what that is. Brilliant. A lot of that is probably in the public domain, um, if you're a large organisation, or it probably sits within your uh, corporate finance office. They're so normally the people who hold that information. So Charlotte, there is an overhead, but it's straightforward. And like a segue on, on hospital radio, we're going to cut now to Christina, who's going to tell us a little bit more about that process. Christina, a big smile there. Sorry, I kind of landed you in it there. How does that process work? And introduce yourself, first of all. Hi, Toby. Thank you. So I'm Christina Goodman. I'm the Planning and Operations uh, Lead for Apprenticeships here at Cranfield. Um, and essentially, I'm here to support employers and applicants all the way through that <clears throat> first thought of this apprenticeship looks amazing, I want to come to Cranfield, all the way to that registration day that Anne-Marie was talking about where we see their smiling faces and they're excited, <laughs> they're here and they're ready to learn. Um, so quickly going back to that expression of interest form, um, it is all the information we need about um, you as an employer um, to ensure that we can set your record up uh, and that we are happy and know that you can support your apprentices when they're on programme. And as Anne-Marie said, the best people within your organisation to sort that out are either the uh, learning and development team who already support other apprentices um, at different levels within your organisation um, or somebody from your finance team. Um, who will possibly be assigned with paying the apprenticeship levy fees um, as well. So uh, they would be best to help you in this first instance. What we want to say is it shouldn't be the person that's applying. Uh, it does need to be somebody else within the organisation. So, Christina, you're going to say, Charlotte, shouldn't worry. No one should worry on the call. It's straightforward. All straightforward. And if there are any questions at all, I'm here to help. And there's Anne-Marie and her team as well. So between us all, we will ensure that all the paperwork is in place and ready and that you have that application link ready to apply. Brilliant. I know you've got some slides for us, but just a reminder, please stay in touch. If you've got any queries now, now's a good time to ask those. So Chris, Christina, I'm going to hand you over to you and your slides. Thanks, Toby. So we've been talking about the apprenticeship, but essentially what is an apprenticeship? And so I'm going to talk through some of uh, the benefits of, you know, why do that over and above um, a standard part-time MSc programme. So an apprenticeship provides you with the opportunity to upskill your uh, employees' current knowledge, skills and behaviours uh, that are outlined within the apprenticeship standard. Um, and it's a chance for apprentices to develop um, personally as well. Um, it supports the employer um, and it can add value to an organisation straight away. So as, as Anne-Marie was saying, you learn with us four times a year and your employees will take that knowledge from the classroom and bring it straight back into the workplace. You're not waiting for somebody to finish a full-time degree. Um, your employees are actively encouraged to take their learning back, apply it and then evidence how they've been applying it so they can't just keep it all to themselves. Um, and it's a way to um, enhance networking for your employee as well. So as Anne-Marie said, they have a fantastic cohort um, of people from varied organisations and in, in varying roles as well. 
and they get to essentially form this new uh, network um, and they, they, these other students become their best friends as well because uh, let's face it, you're working full time, you're also doing an apprenticeship, um, it is going to take more of your time up uh, and therefore these new people will become your new best friends too. So if we go on to then the next slide. So other elements of an apprenticeship uh, that are really helpful over and above undertaking um, a part-time uh, MSc course is that in this sense and your, uh, employ you have the full support of your employer. You have uh, all your training is paid for you, so all that apprenticeship, that part one apprenticeship is fully paid for by the apprenticeship levy from um, that ring fence fund. So if your employer pays into the apprenticeship levy, um, all the fees can come out of there. Um, so there is nothing for you as the apprentice to pay. If you're not from a levy paying organisation, so from you're a really small organisation, an SME, you don't pay into the levy, it's not a problem. Um, the government do what's called co-funding and that's where they pay 95% of the apprenticeship levy fee um, and your organisation pay just 5%. So it's an absolute fantastic opportunity. Um, and there is that, uh, as Anne-Marie was talking about, that opportunity to continue on after your apprenticeship. Um, so you're getting the apprenticeship qualification and masters and um, the CIM qualifications as well. Um, and letters after your name, all important. Uh, and it's the chance to um, upskill existing employees as well. So you've got your CPD courses in uh, internally, but this is something external with the opportunity to get more than one qualification um, by completing uh, one course. If we go on to the next slide. So the benefits, I think Anne-Marie's actually covered many of these, um, so it's that hands-on <laughs> learning. I feel like I'm going over it no, a bit again, good, but we're, we're just reinforcing. So um, what you learn in the classroom is applied straight away, um, and they have what's called on-the-job training. Um, so you'd be applying all that knowledge. Uh, many of the assignments require you to take problems from the workplace um, and look at them and explore those, work with your colleagues, um, that new network that you're forming um, to look at different ideas. Um, you get to develop um, the relevant skills so that um, uh, apprenticeship standard, totally forgot what they were called then, <laughs> the, the apprenticeship standard outlines those knowledge, skills and behaviours that you will be obtaining. And th those apprenticeship standards were designed by industry, so it's exactly what industry wants from you as an employee. If we go on to the next slide. And um, so we've already talked about those recognised qualifications. So I think the total was in and around four by the by the time you've done the apprenticeship and then you've carried on to that MSc, you, you get around four qualifications for that two years worth of work. And I don't know of any other way to get that many in such a short period of time. It's such a great opportunity. Um, as Anne Marie said, we've got such a diverse um, range of apprentices. Um, from all sorts of areas um, across different industries all coming together in the same classroom. So that common thing is marketing, but actually they all want to become leaders in marketing in their own uh, different areas. Um, it does create really good uh, networks, um, the ability to bounce ideas off each other, and essentially a lot of Cranfield students form those friendships for life um, once they become one of our alumni. Uh, and it's lifelong learning. There's, uh, as Anne Marie said, she did the, the wrong degree the first time. <laughs> and I would say that if uh, I knew about apprenticeships um, at degree level, I'd have done an apprenticeship instead. I just think the opportunities are absolutely fantastic to um, complete uh, such a, an in depth course uh, that somebody else is paying for and supporting you with that time off uh, work. So your employee gives you that time to come into Cranfield and learn face to face on campus. Um, you don't have to take annual leave, it's not part of your holiday, it's not unpaid leave. Your employer is paying you, paying you while you're here as well as your apprenticeship levy fee. So it's just such a great opportunity. If we go on to the next slide. So why, why choose Cranfield? Um, so you've already heard from Anne-Marie, and I think that's convincing enough. Why would you not want to come and learn from Anne-Marie and, and um, <laughs> all the other uh, faculty within the School of Management? I wanted to just cover some other points as well. Um, so we are inclusive at Cranfield. We're very accessible, and we've got teams here. So if you do have any additional learning needs, please do not worry. We want to hear about those at the application stage so that we are here ready to support you in your learning from day one. We have one of the highest levels of academic staff to student ratios within the UK, so it's one to five. And what that doesn't include is the fantastic apprenticeship tutors uh, that support all of our apprentices. So when you start here as an apprentice, 
um, you'll be assigned an apprenticeship tutor to ensure that you are on track and you're making great progress with your apprenticeship throughout. We also have the Apprenticeships Office that are here to support you and your employer um, throughout the duration of the apprenticeship. Whoever's got a question, we're here and ready to help. Um, there is holistic development throughout the programme. We've got absolutely excellent pass rates. This is something that we are really proud of. So at the moment, we are sitting at a 97% pass rate. And so that is um, for, across all of our apprenticeship programmes. Um, many apprenticeship programmes have the uh, merit in distinction, and we actually get more distinctions than we get passes. So no pressure for anybody who's thinking of applying right now that you must get a distinction by the end. But we do have high expectations. Um, it's an uh, high quality education, you've already heard from Anne-Marie. The School of Management is ranked in the top 10 in the world, so we're really proud of that, and it's something that um, you will really enjoy being part of. And as I said before, we've got um, support for both the apprentice and their employer. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. Um, so this is a bit about how we teach, um, although I think actually Anne-Marie has given a lot more detail. Um, it does say blended delivery, so we do have um, some online content, but that is to reinforce what is learned face-to-face -face in the classroom. Um, we do have a collaborative, um, sorry, we have close collaboration with our employers, as Anne-Marie said before, and with the CIM. Um, so if we go on to the, the next slide. So this is my last slide and this is possibly the most important one now, so it's how to apply. So we've already talked about the expression of interest which had the deadline of the 12th of February, is that right Toby? Yes. 12th of February. Um, so what happens once uh, an employer submits an expression of interest, we go straight back to you with the application link for you to share internally and that's to make sure you are sharing that with those that you want to apply for the apprenticeship. Um, Apprentices then complete um, an academic application, so it's hearing all about them, their motivation for the programme. I'm sure Anne-Marie can cover in a minute the sort of thing we'd like to see in the personal statement and the length. Um, they then complete what's called an initial assessment, and that is to make sure they're eligible for that apprenticeship funding. Um, so this should have been covered really with the HR or L&D teams beforehand, but we have to do a double check to make sure that the funding we claim from the government um, you are eligible for. You also get to do a maths and English assessment. It's an assessment, not a test, so hopefully nobody worries too much about this, um, but we have to understand your current working levels. The uh, Education and Skills Funding Agency deem maths and English to be essential skills. We do as well agree with that at Cranfield, um, so you do an assessment uh, prior to starting. Um, we also do inductions for our employers and confirm to them once we have made offers. Um, so your employers can come from, for a webinar to find out um, how to support you through the duration of your apprenticeship. So that is it from me. I'm going to hand back over to you, Toby, now. Brilliant. Christina, I'm a little suspicious. This seems too good to be true. Is there a catch? No. No, it, it does sound too good to be true, doesn't it? You're, you're essentially getting all these free qualifications whilst earning full time and being supported by your employer. What more could you want? A qualification bonanza. There is a question from DH, uh, and I think it's been answered in the text chat, so please keep those questions coming. Is accommodation separate from the cost of the module? You're going to say it is. Yes, yes. So uh, because it's optional, it's not an essential part of the apprenticeship. Um, it isn't included in the apprenticeship fee, but we do have two fantastic hotels on site here at Cranfield. One even has a swimming pool, uh, which is only a five minute walk, I believe, from uh, Anne-Marie's classrooms. Um, so <laughs> I'd highly recommend staying there. They also have a bar for social activities in the evening. Wow. And I should just jump in there and say, we have special rates for students. So whatever the advertised rates are, we have special rates for students. All uh, right, so don't go looking at the website the, thinking that's um, the cost. It's yeah, not that there's, cost. There's an additional thing there. And one of the things, I think Charlotte asked earlier about the expression of interest. If you've already, if you're already running an apprenticeship somewhere, you've already got that information. If you're actually running an apprenticeship at Cranfield, you've already submitted an EOI, so we know all of that detail. We might just need you to refresh and update on a few things. So Charlotte, for example, you may not need to fill in all that information because we may already have all of that available to us something to bear in mind. There's a follow-up question from Charlotte, but I want to come back to that in a second because I want to talk to Sarah. Sarah, who's the current student on the programme, and to which you can ask all sorts of awkward questions, <laughs> which Sarah can answer. Sarah, it's fantastic to have you with us. It's great to seeing you again. We've been in these, uh, these chairs before now. 
tell us uh, how is it going, <laughs> um, and why did you choose Cranfield? Oh my goodness! Well, first of all, how is it going? Um, um, I'm still absolutely loving it. Um, we are in month, uh, I think, thirteen um, of our, our, our MSC. Uh, we've actually just been to the Trust Institute of Marketing. Uh, I have met James. We had uh, we had a group got together last week. So uh, another amazing establishment. Um, why have I come to Panto? Why am I doing this in the first place? I am one of those people that have a non-existent further education. I literally worked my way through the earlier part of my career, uh, kind of hiding it, if I'm completely honest with you. Um, and through my work in sales administration and then moving into sales and product marketing, uh, I found that I was, you know, actually kind of really getting a handle on some of the, I suppose, what I would call a subject matter expert and putting, you know, having an idea of what was going on there, but really felt that actually I needed something else to bring it all together. I wanted, I wanted to substantiate what I already knew uh, and all the, everything that I've been doing in my career to date. Um, but secondly, I knew that there was more, you know, and Marie talked around the strategy uh, and talked around, you know, managing huge changes. And it was that element that actually I did not have in my toolbox. Um, so, you know, with my employer, uh, I was given the opportunity uh, and there was a choice uh, that, uh, of where I could do my apprenticeship uh, and having spoken to Cranfield, I didn't speak to anybody else. So, um, <laughs> everything um, we looked, um, you know, we've been through on this full day today really resonated with me. You know, we talked about, you know, the on-campus learning, uh, the number of modules, what they actually cover, the areas that they cover. Uh, and then also the collaboration with other students. All of those elements have been brought together. And I am still as excited today as I was. Wow, wow, yeah, brilliant ambassador. Sarah, what advice would you give to people thinking, um, I haven't done too much finance and there's finance on this course. What advice would you give? And that finance is just one example. Don't worry. Don't, Don't worry. worry. It's, it's, it's actually, and you know, I am not a numbers person in any way, <laughs> shape or form. Um, but what you have, and you know, Anne Marie again has talked about people with real world, real life, you know, examples and being able to bring things into context. So when you are learning something for the first time and learning it as maybe a slightly more mature student, um, that actually there is the experience that you're recollecting, there's the experiences that you're sharing with your, your fellow students. And of course, you have got the most amazing delivery of the lectures through Cranfield. Um, so that those lecturers actually put all of that information into context for you as well. So if you're learning about accounting and finance uh, and you haven't done it before, don't worry. If you're learning about how to do segmentation and you've done it, then never done it before, don't worry because everybody is on hand to give you as much support as they possibly can. So not only through the lectures, but if you've got questions that you've got while you're doing the assignments, you can post them onto a group forum. Um, so there is that feeling of constantly being supported for every single assignment that you're writing. Wow, that's impressive too. And those four times a year, Sarah, where you come onto campus, what advice would you give? I guess you're going to say don't worry about it, but you do need to sort accommodation. Um, what, what advice? Look, it's work hard, play hard. You know, I go on those courses knowing full well that at the end of the week I'm going to be, I'm going to say, joyously shattered. If, <laughs> if that's the time. That's um, a level two I, shattered, yes. <laughs> I am. I am so. Um, I suppose when I get when I go home after those courses, you know, I'm shattered because the brain power that's needed mm -hmm. during the course of the week, you know, is is exhausting. Um, but at the same time, you come away from those courses just bursting with ideas, full of new knowledge. And I, I think I explained it, it's, it, I have this kind of cycle of, you know, I've got this, uh, that you're inputting data, it's, you know, you're at Cranfield, you're learning, you're learning. And simultaneously, I've almost got another to-dos list going on because as I'm learning, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, I'll apply that next week. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I need to, I, I'll take that information because I need to look at this um, in two weeks time. So. You know, the application of the information that you're being given is almost in real time. Um, and, you know, or then being able to take it away, you know, and apply it, 
try it in different ways. You know, I've learned models for, for one assignment that I've then moved on and thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is actually a really good model for something else that I'm actually looking at at the moment. So, um, so bringing everything together, you know, really makes it an amazing experience. So it sounds like your colleagues are thinking, wow, Sarah's been on a course because she's amazing now. <laughs> Well, I don't know whether they'd say that. <laughs> I'm assuming they will. I'm assuming they will do. Wow. I'll, I'll jump in there and I'll say they would. Sarah's also one of our course reps because we have course reps who feed back to me as course director exactly what they think, where they were, you know, where they're looking for changes. Mm -hmm. So when we do get that feedback, we do actually act on it. Right. And Sarah, we've heard already from Anne Marie and from James and from Christina, uh, you make friends for life. So you learn as much from your colleagues, is that right? Absolutely. I mean, it, it is, and, and I think, you know, the, the lady asked about this, the blended learning. I, yes. would, I would actually respond to that to say, going to those, to, to those courses as a group and being there as a group is actually really important because the conversations don't stop at six, you know, 5.45, 6 o'clock. Uh, you know, yes, invariably we get together and we have supper in the evenings, um, but you're also, talking through what happened during the mm. day you mm. know doing the, the nice reflective side of it you know looking at what were the great things that you wanted about that day and actually how the, how your fellow students are actually going to use them at work and that because you have got a diverse set of students and you know Anne Marie is right they are all amazing they are friends for friends for life without a doubt but everybody comes with a different perspective so you know, whether I'm, um, you know, whether I'm talking to somebody who's from an educational establishment or somebody who's a graphic designer or somebody who's from an agency, you know, or somebody who's a, a marketing director in a completely different type of organization to the organization I'm in, you're, you're gaining everything from it. And, you know, it's actually being quite nice to be able just to sit down and go, oh, did I get that bit right in that lecture mm. this afternoon? Or mm. wasn't that particularly interesting? And it will spur another discussion between, mm. you know, between students. Or I've got an idea, can I run this by you? How would it work yeah. in your sector? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Think, yeah. think back, Sarah, to your, when you were filling out that expression of interest, or you weren't filling it out, but your employer was. Charlotte's worried about it. You don't need to worry, Charlotte. Was that mm -hmm. straightforward for you? Was that easy? Um, I think from what I remember, yes. I mean, it is, you know, it, it is a, you, you need to put some time into it. Uh, and I think that there was that also the application as to, you know, why I wanted to do the course. For me, that was something that I just needed to sit down and, you know, and, and write. Because, you know, when you sit back and think about what is the apprenticeship going to give you? What is the work with Tangible going to, you know, what value is it going to add to your career? What value is the class institute of marketing going to add? And all of a sudden, you can really see and, you know, shape your application around that because you know full well, this is a qualification for life. And, mm. you know, whatever um, happens in your career, how it may flourish, how it may move in different directions. And I, you know, we've certainly talked as a group about, my goodness, you know, you could go off and you could do this. Now you've got to, you know, now you've learned, uh, now you've learned something new, you know, from the course. So, um, so actually, there is a world in front of you what that you need to show that you can access you know when you're applying for the apprenticeship you're making me want to come on the course uh, there's a question sarah from jessica jessica's saying sarah how much time are you getting or setting aside in working week to support your studies is it hours and hours is it every evening that's a really good question jessica and thanks for that you do need to put the work in you know there's there was no two ways about it um you have your courses that you're doing at Cranfield, and then from there, you know, Anne Marie's talked about what have we got? Eleven assignments. I think I'm just looking at a list, with Anne Marie. I think uh, eleven. Yeah, I'm on about uh, number nine or ten at the moment. <laughs> uh, or just about to start number ten. Leading change uh, from the class of the student marketing is next on the list. Um, you do need to put in time, and what I have done over the last year is really sit down and look at my schedule over, you know, over the course of my week. When can I realistically can I set aside time? When do I need to put time aside? So it's about managing your own time. Um, don't worry about, you know, every, you know, don't worry about all of the assignments. You know, I would call it about, don't eat, try and eat all of your elephants all in one go. <laughs> you know, start with the first assignment, you know, looking at those both individual and group assignments. So um, looking at actually kind of making sure that you're putting time aside. 
if you were going to ask me, you know, how many hours a week do I spend on this? Uh, I remember, first of all, that, that Prevost, I think I was having some initial sessions that were about an hour a day, and I would actually say that's about right. So whether I'm spending half an hour, you know, reading or just kind of looking at a specific thing in the evenings, or whether I'm just maybe putting two or three hours aside, you know, each day at the weekend. Uh, however, whatever works for you in your life, um, it, it's worth just kind of looking at that and making time and, and being specific about when you're going to work on those assignments um, because that way you get into a, a regular routine um, and then that really sets you up for the two years. Brilliant. Sarah, thank you so much. Jessica, don't worry, uh, but do take that advice on board. We've only got uh, four minutes left. What advice would you give to people thinking, other than fill out the expression of interest and meet the deadlines, what, what advice in the last few minutes? I think the key thing is to look at, you asked earlier about what would you put in the personal statement. Mm. I don't want war and peace because I see every application and I either approve it or I do reject some because they're not ready for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what's your motivation? Why do you want to do this and why now? Right. That's the key thing. What's driving you? What's driving you? Yeah. And if you're driven because either you want to get a promotion, internally you want to get to that next level, you want to cement your qualifications, get some qualifications, that's great. But that motivation keeps you going through the program. And the great thing is, when you get a qualification, nobody can take it away from hey. you. You've got it, Yay. you've done it, you've, you've then done it. And the biggest thing students say to me when they're graduating is, I don't know how I found the time. And but I did. The time flew. Right. The two years went really, really quickly. Wow, there you go. Time flies when you're having fun. Christina, can I come back to you just for the last piece of advice that you would give people, deadlines, websites, stuff like that? Yes, um, so I would do that expression of interest. So get your L&D team or your finance team, HR, to submit that expression of interest as early as possible so that we can get those application links out to your organization and that gives you that time to focus on that application. Um, I think with the applications as well, it's most important that you submit prior to the deadline. We're not like a job uh, application and we wouldn't reject it if you're missing a document or something. So it's more important to submit it by the deadline than to have all the documents in place. We'll always come back to you and ask for anything that's missing. Uh, we wouldn't ever discard an application because you haven't uploaded a certificate, for example. Brilliant. Very quickly, last question, Christina. I've just completed this DH. I've just completed my undergraduate degree on an apprenticeship. Would I need to redo my maths and English even though I have evidence of completion? We would still get you to do that initial assessment so we know your current working level. But if you've got those maths and English GCSE certificates, that's fantastic because you will need that evidence before you can go through Gateway on your apprenticeship. Brilliant. So DH, you're pretty much there. James, uh, I can come back to you because we've t heard talk about letters behind your name. What sort of letters are we talking about? We love letters behind our names. Uh, uh, um, so uh, as a professional member of, of CIM, um, so we, have a, um, we basically have three main member grades, associates, a full member, or a fellow. And basically the first letter changes each time from an ACIM, an MCIM, and uh, uh, an FCIM, we don't have time to go through the criteria, but basically, um, based on the level of experience and doing the qualification, essentially, uh, we will assess you separately. It's not an exam, it's just looking at where you are and what you've done to make sure that we are giving you the appropriate member grade um, for where you are. Um, the, 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 the real special one for me, though, is Charter Marketer, because that is something different. And, uh, Unlike Anne Marie's points about no one can take your qualifications away from you, mm. Charter Marketer can be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. Charter Marketer is a bit different. And by the time you finished the program, you would have got to a point where actually you'll be able to apply and be accepted for Charter Marketer status. The reason it's different is um, if you don't continue to evidence that you're current and up to date and developing yourself, then you can't keep chartered marketer. So if you imagine an accountant or a doctor or a pilot, we all want to know that yes, you qualified, but you're still current. And you that's bet. what chartered marketer is. So Brilliant. it's just about keeping it after Brilliant. that and keeping developing. 
Brilliant. James, thank you so much. That's good. Yeah, we want to know that you're qualified to do what you do. So thank you very much indeed. We have run out of time. Ed, the amazing globetrotting Ed has just left, but thank you. We want to hear from you. That should be obvious from now. I take it that you want to hear from everyone too. Absolutely. Uh, we're looking forward to meeting you in April. So thank you. Hopefully you've got enough information. If you've gotten this far in the recording, well done. Keep the conversation going with us here at Cranfield. Uh, James, Christina, um, and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Anne Marie, thank you very much indeed for your time. The studio managers today were Robin Hackett, Marco Gomez, the producers were Tammy Arjun Peters, Haley Rook, and Sophia Grillo. My name is Toby Thompson. Thank you for watching. <laughs>